Broadcasting from Baltimore, Maryland, this is 5 by 3 Radio, where strength is for everyone. I'm your host, Emily Sobolinski, owner of 5 by 3 Training, a strength and conditioning gym in Baltimore, along with my co-host, Rebecca Fishburn, founder of Cornerstone Strength Maryland. Each week, Rebecca and I will discuss the ins and outs of strength training, why there is a no one size fits all approach, and why strength is so important in our daily lives. Thanks for spending some time with us today. Now, on with the show. All right, hi everybody, and welcome back to another uh, episode of 5 by 3 Radio. Today is Monday, and we had um, originally <laughs> planned this podcast for last week, but somebody forgot to hit record. So we got about a halfway, <laughs> half an hour into our nice discussion on squatting, and uh, I realized that I hadn't been recording anything the whole time. So we just use that so as a practice session. We're going to try and recreate session. it with some sort we of like are. authenticity as though it were the first time we were discussing this. Exactly, exactly. And I, <laughs> I, I told Rebecca, I said, well, that was practice run. So now we can make our notes <laughs> and we can uh, do another another run. So this is um, this is take two <laughs> of our of our, five, five, of our radio podcast today. So um, we... Oh, I, I, before we get into it, I wanted to say that so one of my members was quite disappointed, unhappy with my um, discussion of straps in our last episode of gear. Oh, really? Yes, Jesse. Why? This is a shout out to Jesse because uh, he uses straps and it sounded like I was against them. I am not against straps. Anybody? Well, yeah, no. I mean, well, if you want straps all the time. These you, days. Rebecca uses them all the time. Like all the time. Because like all I the am time. Not, yeah, I'm not competing anymore. <laughs> so. So I'd say straps are a, uh, they could, they can be certainly an essential, uh, tool to have in your gym bag, um, to, to not give out your grip, especially as, as the weight's getting heavier. I mean, I just don't seem to, I'm not deadlifting a lot of heavy weight people these days, right? As I said, as Gretchen, and I said the other day, you know, we are two older middle-aged women. <laughs> yeah. You're not though. <laughs> So we have to be mindful. You keep forgetting what that we I do know what you when you say these things. <laughs> what we do, what we pick up, you know that kind of thing. Um, so it, it doesn't even like I just doesn't doesn't register to me. You know what I what I use. I mean, I'm like if I can hook grip the bar and pick up the weight that way, I, I don't need to worry about using straps. But if I were to pick up heavier weight and my grip wouldn't give it out, wouldn't wouldn't be there, and my and if I actually just practice with them, that's one thing. But I don't want to practice with them, so you know. It's like uh, I'm learning Spanish now, and I'm actually practicing and taking classes, so I'm not just winging it. What do you mean you're taking classes? Where are you doing that? Online. Are you, you're not just you're doing. No, you're I'm doing. I do three days a week or something. No, three days like, a week, oh, forty-five oh. minutes, forty-five minutes a day. Wow. So that's why today I don't have class, so I'm able to do the podcast with you on a Monday, because I don't have class. That's exciting. But Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at three o'clock, I am speaking hablo espanol um yes i finally and i'm i'm really I'm, i love it i love my teacher i'm enjoying it and it's only taken me <clears throat> 18 years of you know dating a and then being married to <laughs> a, a spanish speaker <laughs> to actually start to learn spanish <laughs> don't anybody judge me um i'm doing it now and that's what yeah. matters we thought we would come back around, and this was a great idea from one of my coaches, to just a discussion on the different lifts. So we're going to start with the squat today, and we we thought a just a, a quick, quick and simple podcast to talk about key points, key helpful cues to think about when you squat. Um, I really like the squat discussion that we we do at our camps. Um, that Diego he does the lecture. I like it's yes we go we have a practical component to the to the camp but there are some definite cues and you know certain instructions that we give people that will help their squat immensely will right, help especially beginners mm -hmm. who, learn, who are learning this um, and so Rebecca and I thought a nice discussion on just some key points some bullet points to think about when you are squatting. Um, do you, would you like to take it away? Kind of, uh, dis, I kind of, I know that we have a, a couple points here. What we want to kind of talk about first. You want to start off? Or you want me to start off? What yeah, you, you start, Emily. Me start? Oh, you good start. Lord. Yeah, we don't have the video okay. camera. So. <laughs> we don't. We're not looking at each other today. Today oh, is kind strange. of, we're talking on the phone, which is, you know, very, uh, very strange because nobody talks on the phone anymore, do they? I mean, I, I do. Well, FaceTime. 
right? FaceTime, right, FaceTime. So even then, you know, you're seeing the person, which is great, which was actually really nice during the 2020, 2021 years when you couldn't see anybody. Um, yeah, anywho, but squat. <laughs> but now, anyway, moving on. Um, so setup. Let's just talk about the setup first. And this is, I'm talking about, this is for any type of squat we're talking about. We're going to use a low bar squat as an example, because that is the squat that Rebecca and I use predominantly with our clients. Um, that's where the bar sits a little bit lower on your back, but high bar squat, front squat. I don't think it matters really when we talk about just the squat. You want to think about a setup. You always want to think about your setup. Um, and you want to try to replicate that setup every single time you get out of the bar. So if we're using this, the low bar as an example, and we're going to call it just the squat because that's what, you know, that's what we do. Um, but we are talking about the bar placement a little bit lower. Um, some key points to think about with a squat. So you want to make sure that your setup is on point. You want to place your hands where they're going to be every single time that you get under the bar, right? Whether that is a fairly wide grip, if you have some inflexible shoulders and some mobility issues, or that's a narrow grip, if you are less that if you are flexible. So your grip matters where you place your hands on the bar, but you want to try and find that position every single time. And it can change. Let's say it starts off very wide and then you find yourself as you warm up, you can move the hands in a little bit, do so, but make that part of your routine, <laughs> right? I definitely noticed that about myself when I had to take a little wider grip due to some shoulder issues, I would start off fairly wide and then slowly as I would warm up, I could move my hands in. And I did that every single time because every time I got in the bar when I was, you know, fresh, um, I was tight still, yeah. you know, things needed to warm up. So that's what I was. So I would just kind of start to move my hands. in. so placing that, that their hands try to replicate that every single time. It's just not kind of wishy-washy. Think about how you're playing, well, how you're grabbing the bar. Like, Go ahead. Do, do you ever have people who are brand new to barbell training? Cause I have this and yes. I've had this a couple of times and it just strikes me as odd, but it's more than, more than one time, right? Like you've got the markings on the bar mm-hmm. and you'll have people who are like not any, uh, barbell background or experience kind of just place in their hands willingly right. without right. any sort of um, attention to whether they're symmetrically placed on the bar. Yes. So, you know, maybe like one hand is over near the markings and the other one is right smack in the middle of the neural. Right. So right. It's totally not even symmetrical on the bar. Yeah. Yeah. I was yeah, it to be interesting. Like, you know, you're trying to get yeah. this weight balanced on your back and, and, um, so, yeah, sometimes people even need um, that even placement on the bar to do something. Exactly. That exactly. I mean, there is that. there is a technique, right? There is technique involved with this type of um, training, this exercise, this sport. Um, there's technique involved with you know taking a ballet class. There's technique involved with you know with uh, jujitsu. There's technique involved with soccer. Anything that requires you to hold something or move something or kick something, there is going to be technique involved. And you want to establish a proper routine, right? A proper setup for you. And everyone's routine is going to be different. But when you find one that works for you, you want to try to replicate that over and over again, right? Um, so definitely your, your grip on the bar. Now your grip could be a thumbs over or a thumbs around. That doesn't really matter. I'm not concerned with where you, where I, you grab I think the bar. We sort of talked about that at one point mm-hmm. before, and that's got yep. a little bit more to do with, you know, it might have considerations about, you know, range of motion or it might exactly. have um, elbow, exactly. like elbow pain or shoulder yes. pain or something like that. But, yes. you know, where you're putting them on the bar in relation to each other and in re- relation to the markings on the bar, right. which is kind of more what you're talking about. Exactly. And when you find that grip, you know, you can play around with both, right? I have people who kind of try to figure out which grip works best for them and they'll be able, they'll know right away. Once you've established it, keep it, keep it. Um, I mean, sure, you, you could always go back to one, but if that really works for you, there's no reason why you need to squat with the thumbs over when thumb, thumbs around works just as well, if not better for you, right? Um, I tell people the thumbs over is not part of the <laughs> how to squat. <laughs> yeah. It's just a grip. It's just, I guess, you know, to some degree, maybe that comes back to the discussion, maybe about straps in a way. Like people have these mm-hmm. ideas of what's the proper way to do it. Right. And it's hard sometimes to get people to realize like, oh, well, it is okay to go ahead and use straps at this point if your grip is given yeah. out, it, you know, or it yeah. is okay to do thumbs around if that's how you can get the bar on your back without yeah. causing yourself pain. And 
Yeah, I mean, the only the only reason for the thumbs, you know, over is, and we've talked about this before, teaching people that the bar is supported on their back. That because if you grab the bar with the thumbs around, oftentimes people who are new will let the bar just sit and roll into their hands, and then it produces a lot of force on their wrist. Yeah. That feels it's, that's really uncomfortable. Once they understand that it's not the hands, quote unquote, that are that that are holding the bar, but the back, then the wrist issue kind of goes away. The wrist can be bent. They can be bent. They won't hurt if you are properly supporting that bar with your back, right? And that so that goes along with where the bar is placed on your back is part of your setup. And you want to place that bar there every single time. And it might be different for different people, right? Some people, I, I teach people to, you know, step under the bar and slide the bar down to the, the little shelf that your back will make when you're, it's a right, you know, below the spine, the scapula. But other people find that taking two legs under and getting set up that way works best for them. Again, it's going to de be determined by just you and where the bar sits on your back how, you know, where you can find it, where you can keep it tight, but you try to find that same place every single time. And you do that by getting the under the bar the same way every single time. Don't change it up. <laughs> Don't just, you know, willy nilly get under the bar. I like, you know, when you said about grabbing the bar with their hands, it, there should be a specific way that you take to get under the bar, find that bar, let it settle on the back and take a few moments to really make sure that the bar is placed where you want it to be. I think people like to, they tend to rush. You know, Where they sort of like part. duck under the bar, immediately yeah. stand up and step back in sort of right. like one right. fluid motion instead right. of like, okay, does the bar feel placed properly? Exactly. Because exactly. sometimes is, if you yeah. haven't totally unracked it yet, you can notice if you've accidentally misloaded your bar. Oh, yes. Got distracted oh, yes. halfway through and didn't add like the 10 pound weight to the other side yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. I've, quite, I've seen quite a few people do that. In the gym, you know, get on the bar, start to stand up, put the bar back down, take a step back and go, ah, I forgot a plate or oops, I put the wrong plate on there. And, other, and sometimes people will do that and they'll come back out and the plates are just fine. It just feels a little weird. <laughs> so better to re-rack the bar and then try again instead of just kind of just saying, well, the bar's there. No, the bar may not be there. But then you want to try to find that rhythm every single time you do that. I, have, I like uh, watching Grace get under the bar for her squats. She has a thing. She pulls herself under, you know, with one leg. She gets the other leg under. Then she rocks a little bit onto her heels. Her toes come up off uh -huh. the floor. And then she stands up. And she does it the same way every single time, no matter what the weight is on the bar. She does it with her empty bar, her 95 pounds. I, I love it. I just, it's just, it, she has figured out what works for her. Someone else doesn't do that. If someone else, you know, steps under with one leg, pulls the other leg under, you know, moves around, stands up, moves around, stands up again, moves around. I mean, it, it, it's, it doesn't matter what you do as long as that bar is secure by the time you stand up and walk back. So what I, I'd like to turn it over to you now. We've done the setup. We've done the grip. What about unracking the bar? Well, I mean, we're kind of talking about that a little bit. Like, you know, take it slow and in steps. Yep. And think of it as um, separate movements as opposed to a fluid motion. So get that bar positioned, be confident of where it is on your back, squat it up out of the rack. And then I usually tell people take two steps backwards, by which I mean one step with your left foot, one step with your right foot. Right. And kind of in an ideal scenario going from, you know, like a regular standing position where maybe your feet are a little closer together, um, maybe they're parallel or forward facing and then when you step back you get your right foot set into its squat stance and then your left foot set into its squat stance so not like taking a you know big walking journey with the bar on your back some right. people will take two steps three steps with each foot you know mm -hmm. um sort of look around uh check their feet out with their eyes like <laughs> duck their head down bars like swinging all around on their back so you know that's a conversation that i i often end up having with a person who's a mm -hmm. lifter. um like learn learning to feel with your body uh, yep. when the bar is in the proper position when your feet are in the proper position rather than looking at those things with your eyes so i mean when you take those two steps back they're you know substantial enough that it sort of sets you up in the middle 
uh, sort of just in the middle of your safety arms, right? right. Or like right. if you're not using safety arms, you're in the middle of your rack. So you got your pin and pole on either side and you're right in the middle of that. You mm -hmm. want to be far enough back that you're not going to like smash into the J cups or anything like that when you're squatting um, and be nice and centered in the um, safety arms. Uh, exactly. But not so many steps that you've exhausted yourself because, I don't know, you decide to take a trip with the bar on your back. <laughs> right. I think if you're inside the safety, if you're inside the rack and you try to do that, the rack is going to stop you. Yeah, that's true. If you're <laughs> in actually, the rack, that will yeah. happen. But I have had people with safety arms where they'll they'll walk back like two or three oh, yeah. steps, and then I'm like, okay, let's let's put the bar back in the in the rack. Let's yep. talk about this for a minute. Yep, yep. <laughs> so yep. Walk those three steps back in, and then we sort of go through like I said, take one step, one step back with each foot, two steps back, right? Like you want to be inside these safety arms. Right. You're way over here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I use the safety arms not in the beginning of anybody's training um, as a as a I don't talk about you know using the safety arms for the pro the purpose of obviously catching the bar. Like um, if you anything. miss the rack, I don't because I don't want to I don't want to freak anybody out. I never do that. I never talk about the bar. And this is when you miss when you miss a rep, you know, a, a rep that's way later down in their training. But I do use the spider arms as a this sets you up. This is your place. This is your you know, uh, your, your, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? I can't think of this. This frames your, yeah. mm -hmm. this frames you. So you don't want to go past them because again, you don't want to take, you know, travel too far with the bar because then you have to travel that far to get back into the rack. So, right. And they kind of go, Oh, that makes, makes sense. They don't ask me what the spider arms are for, especially brand new people down the road. We'll talk about it. But in the beginning, it's just to frame their, frame their space. So yes, don't, don't take so many steps that you're all of a sudden, you know, 25 feet away from the bar <laughs> from the bar <laughs> um because that just means you have to walk that much further to get into the rack uh, coming out of the racks you you talked about standing up walking back what do you say when people uh stand up and they as they're walking back they hit the jacobs with their with their bar with the uh -huh. plates so with the plates hit them what what do you and they, they kind of get startled yeah yeah I mean, so, I guess that what, happens from time to time, but I think if you if you sort of approach it a little bit more in um, steps, mm -hmm. like first thing, you're just going to squat it up and you're not mm -hmm. going to immediately start moving. Because once you start right. moving back, if you go from squatting it up to stepping it back altogether, right. that's right. when you're more likely to get a little bit of lateral shift or movement from one step yep. to the other. Yep. So step one, the zero with rep, squat mm -hmm. it up pause for a second and then step back yeah um and and step yeah right like so step back you know straight back <laughs> yep yep Not and also really. yeah and also exactly if they start if you start walking back before you've paused right before you've stood up and stopped it like as you said the zeroth rep it's the very first rep it's the, the quote-unquote first rep out of the uh, out of the rack is there, that's your first squat. Um, and your chest isn't squeezed up enough. If you're not tight enough under that bar, you'll know right away because if you stand up and you pause and you walk back and you still hit the J cups, oftentimes I'll, I'll just wait for, I'll let the person do it. I don't, you know, I don't say anything. They'll do their set. They'll walk it back in. I'll say, so why do you think you hit the J cups? And they'll kind of look at me like, what do you mean? I said, you know, I, you, I noticed you, you know, you kind of got startled. I said, you weren't tight enough. I said, your chest wasn't open enough. I said that you have to use that time to really make sure that that bar is secure on your back. The next time they do it, they stand all the way up. The chest is out. Everything's tight. Nothing. They don't even come close to hitting the J cups. So if you find yourself hitting the J cups as you're walking out of the rack, are you tight enough? Could you be tighter? Most likely you haven't stood up all the way. Most likely you're not as tight as you could be. It's kind of like taking the slack out of the bar when you deadlift. Sure, the bar comes off the floor. Could it have come back up better? <laughs> Could you have been tighter, you know, in that first that first rep? So um, I'll oftentimes I won't let the I won't have the person re rack it. But I'll just talk to them afterwards. Why do you think you hit the J cups? Mm -hmm. You know, and then we talk about what they need to do. And that's how they start to understand what standing up all the way means, and what you know tight you know tight back or big chest means. You know that bar has got to be secure on your back it takes it's going to be you holding it there and that's really hard for many of us who don't aren't used to 
standing up, <laughs> right? We're slouched all the time. Yeah, we're yeah. constantly hunched over things. So that's that takes that's that's a lot. That's why people come away from their squat sessions with their back and their shoulders hurting them more than their legs. Well, yeah, I mean, middle of your upper back, your T spine, mm -hmm. like between your shoulders. Exactly. Legs. Not to be confused with the part of people's backs that they associate with being uncomfortable when they right. squat, which people usually think, oh, I'm going to hurt my low back. Yeah, exactly. And no. it's the muscle soreness that Emily is talking about. Like yeah, yeah. Muscles no. that are usually like slouchy that actually exactly more. Yeah, your po yeah, your yeah. posture, like yeah. your yeah, your traps, your traps. Yeah, yeah and your you know all the the upper the upper uh, upper back. That's that's what's holding on that bar. And for many people, they're not used to doing that. They're not used to holding the, you know holding weight back there or standing up and using their back. There's so much back work that's done in all these exercises. People forget, like, we don't train what we don't see. And that's so true. And that's why we do so much extra back work with a lot of our, a lot of our clients. So set up, grip, unracking the bar, taking the three steps, two steps, two or three steps back, getting set, getting placed. Okay, so next step. So what are some key points to actually doing the squat? Say that again. What are some key points to actually performing, executing the squat? So now we've got everybody kind of back out of the rack. We're tight. We're placed correctly. Our legs are, you know, shoulder width apart, toes turned out 30, 35 degrees, whatever they need to be. What's the first, what's, what's a sort of some key points to think about when you're actually executing the squat now? Yeah. I mean, I guess when we talked about this the first time when we, um, didn't record it, <laughs> like the two cues or the two points of focus that yeah. I find I use most often with people or that are um, pretty helpful for people. One you've already talked about, right? Which is like that Superman chest, get it, right. you know, the chest open, the shoulder, you know, shoulder blades kind of pulled back and down, the bar solid on the back, um, yes. that kind of thing, the Superman chest and the rigid torso along with that. Um, and then the other um, thing I like to point people's attention towards is their feet, um, mm -hmm. because if you're doing your squat and you're, um, if you're, if you're following that master cue and keeping the bar centered over your middle of your foot, your center, um, center of balance, um, then you're going to have equal pressure in your toes right. and your heels. You're not going right. to be forward in your toes. You're not going to be back in your heels. Um, so like, you know, sometimes if you have somebody who will uh, send their hips back before their knees start to travel forward, they'll end up having toes come up at the beginning of the squat. Then they get back uh, to the bottom, to the depth, and their heels will come up at the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, so if you think about equal pressure in toes and heels, um, and then also, it, you know, even pressure on the arch side, the big toe side and the pink mm -hmm. toe side of the foot. Um, a lot of times when you get people with the knees caving in or the knee valgus, um, if you can cue them to keep pressure um, on the outside edge of their foot, that mm -hmm. will help them to, to get their knees shoved out. And sometimes I think for people having to focus on something that is only as big as their foot instead right. of something that is as big or as complex or as many moving parts as there are with squat mm -hmm. just takes the problem and makes it a little bit smaller to focus yeah. on makes it seem a little bit more manageable yeah. um and plus with your foot on the ground you're getting that that tactile feedback that proprioceptive feedback from the floor about where your weight is um mm -hmm. and that's something that people um are are often more easily able to to clue into or to pay attention to yeah so finding that position so finding your stance is is essential like you can't be farting around <laughs> trying to figure out where your where your feet are right where your yeah. legs are and that's part of that setup too because you don't necessarily have your legs set up in the shoulder with, shoulder width position under the bar right? Usually you're taking, you have a much narrower stance and the toes are pointing forward. You stand up from there, then you walk back and you t actually take your stance. So if you're still trying to figure out where your legs should be, and many people when they first start training are doing that, right? They're doing a little dance. Yeah. Well, eventually that dance has to like be set. <laughs> Stop choreographing <laughs> and set the, <laughs> and set it because then 
when you find when you find your stance you can you're doing exactly what rebecca is talking about you're then finding your feet your feet underneath of you right your legs are underneath of you your feet are planted you can feel your toes and your heels and where the middle of the foot is that takes practice that takes you replicating that same setup every single time and you have to practice it i tell people that all the time you will find that stance fast you'll find it sooner you'll find it eventually it's going to take some time as you're learning where the where the right position is for you and i say for you because it might not be the same position for somebody else right but that means and that that's your coach also watching you if you have a coach if you don't have a coach it may take you videoing yourself to see okay that's really the best place you know you can also tell too you can feel it when you're when you're squatting so feeling that grounded that grounded feeling is uh is essential and it only is it only happens if you try to find if you find that same stance every single time that you're uh when you're when you're squatting so you've got your legs underneath of you um i don't necessarily do this on the very first day second day kind of thing you know when talking to people but eventually i I will talk to them about how to get tight and where to start getting tight from do you find a lot of people will rock onto their toes and lift their heels up to get tight do you see that I don't know that I've ever noticed that. I see it. I see that more with just people getting starting, you know, starting the the movement, the actual movement Mm -hmm. pattern where the the toes will rock up. I will see people thinking that they're getting tight and they'll rock on, they'll rock onto their toes. They kind of like do this little like lift of the heels off the floor. I mean, I can imagine that. I could see that. You see that? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, and I've, I've seen that definitely with some dance, some dancers when I've taught dancers how to squat, because that's kind of. You'll see that in the ballet class. Yeah. You'll see people prepare and the heels, the heels might, because you're with dancers, you're, you're talking about they're floating, right? They're supposed to be this ethereal <laughs> creature. So there's always this feeling of like, lift up, lift up. Well, I tell them like, stop that. We don't do that in here. Yeah. <laughs> Keep your heels on the well, floor, but I it's not just dancers. also probably ties in with, there's a cue that you give people later on about um, getting their breath and getting tight. Yes, uh, yes. Where you differentiate between, like a lot of times people, when they get a breath, they don't understand diaphragmatic breathing mm-hmm, and they're breathing mm-hmm. up into their shoulders, yes. up into their upper chest. And so they're lifting in order mm-hmm. to get a big breath. And so mm-hmm. I would imagine if you're lifting and you're doing that, whatever it's called, paradoxical breathing up into your into your yeah. shoulders, that you may also sort of lift up onto your toes, like, okay, here we go. Exactly. Um, and exactly. And now I'm ready and I've got my air and my, you know, whatever. Uh-huh. Yeah, uh-huh. I, I can see that. Uh huh. And so I see that. So when we have, when I see that, and even if I don't see that, I'll start to talk about breathing, which I think is, you know, kind of the next thing that you want to, you want to have, because you're taking the big breath when you walk out of the rack, you might let a little bit of that air out. And then you want to take, you're going to get set again, right? You're going to get set before you come out of the rack. You get, well, you get, you get into your position, you let a little bit of air out yeah. and now you're going to get tight again. And I think talk, that yeah. goes along too with this, like this, I think you and I both coach people in ways to sort of force them to take time. Yes. Um, and, you know, take a breath, pause, step it back. Get yes. your feet screwed into the floor, get your breath yes. again. Like if you have to get another breath or top it off or something mm-hmm. like that, mm-hmm. that slows the setup down because so mm-hmm. often I think with people when they're new to barbell training, if they've got some sort of exercise background, it's usually something that's more like hit related or, you know, AMRAP or, you know, that kind right. of thing where they think they need to speed through um, yes. the, the exercise or speed through the set. Um, and so sort of finding ways like that through cues to force people to slow down so that they're solid and they don't mm-hmm. have to, to deal with momentum that they've right. added to the exercise. Um, I think, yeah, those kind yeah. of yeah. take it's, another it's, breath. A, a yeah, exactly. It slows it down. It slows the pace down. That's, you know, d- definitely another key point we we'll, we'll, want to talk about. So it. Once you've established your position out of the rack, I talk about getting set from the top down, especially if I see somebody rocking onto their toes, like to get set. Like, like you said, they're kind of like, okay, and here I go, right? And you kind of rock yourself forward. I said, no, 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 no. Get set from the top down. Your legs are, are planted. Once those feet stop moving, they don't move. Once you're in position, they don't move. Now we're gonna get tight from the top down. And I usually tell them like, I wanna see basically that breath. You're gonna take a big breath in. And it's going to be, you know, back tight, 
ribs down, abs on, you know, legs tight, concrete feet. I'll call, I'll say concrete feet, like feet planted on the floor. Concrete feet. Concrete feet. So, but I, I tell them breath from the top down. So there's that. And I, and I usually would say, I want to see the shoulders kind of rise and then clamp down when we're discussing that Balsalva breathing, right? Um, talking about the bearing down feeling and, and trying no, to get somebody no, to understand that cue. bearing down really tricky. Bear, well, not bearing down, but taking a big breath and holding it. Yeah, big breath. You know, and hold it. Take take a big breath and hold it. I think I when I say for some people that some people that bearing down though feel like they understand that it's not up here in their chest. It's not up in their throat. It's not. In the, so they're not making chipmunk uh, chipmunk chipmunk cheeks, right? Um, it's just a kind of you know, make your, make your, make, keep the breath into your belly. Yeah. That's it's more it. like That's 360 it. diaphragmatic right. breathing. Like you're, exactly. you're breathing yourself in, you're into a solid core, a solid. Exactly. Register. You're not exactly. breathing up into your neck or your shoulders and you're right. not pushing down onto your pelvic floor either. either. Right. Right. Pulling no, it's just, you take a big breath. Yeah. Take a big breath, hold it. I'll, I'll usually use, I use an example of a chocolate bunny. Yeah. The chocolate bunny, the hollow you've got bunny the, the solid bunny. Exactly. You've got the solid bunny and I'll push, I'll push, you know, I'll like hit my, my belly so you can hear it. And then I'll make a, a chocolate bunny, a hollow bunny. I'll suck all the air in like they do in Pilates. And you can hear a big difference between solid and hollow. It's not hollow. And one of my, actually one of my older clients just figured out, I thought she was breathing properly the whole time and she was holding her breath. She just wasn't holding it in the proper place. And it made a huge difference in how fast her deadlift moved <laughs> as a result. And it was like, I didn't, I wasn't breathing that way. I'm like, you weren't, it was, and it was like, I thought you were breathing that way. She goes, no, I wasn't. I know I had told her that how many months ago or years ago, but it was quite a revelation to her. And all of a sudden things just changed dramatically. It was just something as simple as like remembering like, oh, that's the breathing. Yeah, well, and I know that, we talked that about kind it. kind of breathing in hollow bunny thing is the right. thing that just gets encouraged by, um, you know, whatever the culture at large, like make yourself look skinny kind of. Yeah, thing. exactly. Like, take, hold your belly in. Exactly. Look skinny, which is not, I mean, we're not trying to look a certain way. We're trying to be solid. And I think I like, that's why I like the ab, I like the ribs down, abs on cue, mm -hmm. because that really does. And, and one of my women has, has talked to, I think we've mentioned this before, like taco. She thinks of it as a taco <laughs> for her. It's, we no, call, I we have just not say taco. taco before you're going no? to explain that. Taco. Well, I guess taco is like ribs and abs. And it's like this feeling of like the taco shell kind of, you know, closing together. <laughs> At least that's what I think she thinks of. Yeah, everybody well, when, has these strange, uh, like, yeah. visual cues. That wouldn't so, work for me. Like, our taco shells are always cracking. Soft. <laughs> <laughs> and I eat soft tacos, not even hard tacos yeah. anymore. So, but she has an image of taco. But I like the ribs and at, ribs ribs down, abs on, which is just like in, like in dance when, now we don't do that kind of breathing, but we don't want to have our, our ribs flaring, right? When, we, when we're standing at, at the bar, we don't want to have our ribs flaring and our butt sticking out. We want to bring the belly button and the spine to, you know, the, the ribs and the, and the belly to belly, by, belly button together. So there's a feeling of just everything kind of, you know, locking down. Um, it's, what is it? Supple leopard. It's the whole, it's the bracing. It's bracing. That's what we're teaching somebody to do is basically, you know, learn how to brace properly. Um, so yeah, shoulder, like back tight, you know, bar tight in the back, ribs down, abs on, you know, tight legs, concrete feet. Now we're ready to squat. So once they understand that the getting tight comes from the top down, there's no more dancing around, you know, shifting to the toes, you know, lifting up the heels in, in order to get tight, quote unquote, to get tight. The breathing has to be from the top down, not from the bottom up. It just doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. I'm not totally sure about that, but what breathing from the top. Yeah. How so? Um, cause I mean, I think you want to like, and I'm just coming at this from the perspective of like pelvic floor health. You want to start with the bottom, get that stuff tight, get the transverse abdominals involved too, and get that all kind of locked down, right? So, so that everything from the bottom is locked up and down, right? So that you're, you're, you're um, managing pressure from the bottom end as well as the top end. Yeah, I mean, but I think that I can't, if I try to tell somebody to get t tight from the bottom up, I'm gonna, I'm gonna see them moving around with their, with their legs. Yeah, and I want, well, I want and to this have is the, where I think the cueing for that initially just needs to be very um, general. 
take a big breath and hold it is kind exactly. of where I start. And then yeah. you sort of figure out who you're working with. And yeah, if you're exactly. working with people who, um, you know, have concerns about pelvic floor health, maybe your cueing is going to be different. If you're talking about people who um, uh, understand like a deep breath or that solid bunny thing, like your, you know, solid abs, the cueing might be different. If you have somebody who's breathing up into their neck and shoulders, you might right. have different cueing. Right. Um, but usually I think to, to start out with for most people before it gets into all of those kind of different um, various cues that people need based on what they're actually doing, big breath and hold it. Yeah. I think just for anybody, they need to start thinking about that, you know, the, and where the breath is. Where they're, where they're really breathing and it shouldn't be that complicated. Yeah. You don't need to make it that complicated. A great video that we show all the time and anybody who's listening, you know, if you want to watch a really good solid video of somebody who, who gets set and, and this is exactly how I like to teach people to, to get set in their squat um, is you watch Mike to share. It's from about 10 years ago, but if you go, if you just kind of like YouTube Mike to share, um, 700 pound squat or whatever. Um, it'll pop up. It always pops up and he's squatting in his garage and he's beltless and he's, and it's a great video because he films himself from the front. So you see exactly how he gets under the bar, where the breathing is, how he gets set. And it's exactly the same rep every single time he squats. It's four reps he does. And we show that every single camp we've been showing that since 2015 at our camps. Um, and I think he still squats. He still gets set up the same way. It might be a little bit different than it was 10 years ago, but it's pretty much the same. And it's just a good example of somebody who's showing a, a who's replicating his squat every sing for, for four singles. And that's something that, that we definitely unite both also cue is once you get in position, once you get your, your breath and that you do that first rep, the minute you finish that first rep, you let some air out, not all your air, but you let some air out. You get another big breath, you lock it down and you go into the next rep. So you're doing three singles, four singles, however many reps you're doing, five reps, four reps, but you're doing in a sense, three or four, four or five single reps. That's how you're going to make sure that you're getting to depth every time that you're in the correct position every time, you know, the most, uh, the biggest mistake people make is rushing. Yeah, yeah. Their reps. Well, and this gets back to what we were saying at the beginning too, right? Like the cue of get a breath or, you know, get some air or whatever as a way right. to kind of slow a person down. And so slowing them down between reps, similar to slowing down the process of unracking and then hitting depth on your first rep, just right. making people pause, get tight, think about them as singles as opposed to, you know, a mashed together exactly squats that you're trying to hurry up and get through even though that might be what your brain is trying to tell you you want to do because the bar is right. heavy and you want to get it off your back <laughs> right right and that's what most people say i just want to get it done i'm like you'll get it done better and faster if you're slower and they're like what because <laughs> i love i always go back and i god knows if he actually really said this but my friend mike who's a weightlifter um he's got a gym and and well it wasn't pa i think he's now in new jersey but he uh when teaching me strongman uh -huh. and i was working on the stone he would say to me emily uh fast is bad right because i would fumble i'm trying to get the stone into my into my lap and i keep fumbling with it fumbling it he said fast is bad he said slow is fast fast is good <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, what? But I use that now all the time with people. I'm like, fast is bad. Slow is fast. Fast is good. So the slower, more deliberate you are with your setup, the faster you will be, right? Because you will be able to find that position every single time. So you discover it, like even with strongman, when you are deliberate with your setup, when you're deliberate with how you pick up a stone or how you pick up a sandbag or how you pick up the K, anything you have to be deliberate with your with your setup and your pick, that's going to make you faster. You're going to get that stone over the bar faster. You're going to get that keg up to your, you know, over your head faster, but the setup is everything, the log, right? So it's slow, you know, fast is bad. Slow is fast. Fast is good. And with squatting, with it, it's the same thing, right? You have to be deliberate with your, with your, uh, setup, which will help you be very clear with your execution of the, uh, of the exercise. So you finished your set, you finished your reps. What do you do now? Yeah. So 
when you're when you've got somebody who's kind of brand new to this, mm -hmm. you end up with the opposite end of the same issue, right? Mm -hmm. Like you get somebody who's unracking it and they're trying to find their position with their eyes, like they're looking to their feet to find if they've got um, right. feet in the right position. They end up doing that with the bar when they re-rack it. So mm -hmm. like you'll get people a lot of times brand new to barbell training who are trying to look first to the right, did I get the, the um, bar in the J cup on the right side? And now to the left, did I get the bar over in the J cup on the left side? And meanwhile, this the right side is like, you know, dangerously close to falling out. <laughs> exactly. So what I always tell people when they re-rack in the bar is just imagine you're walking through a door, a door jam, nice. right? Like a doorway. You got yeah. a bar in your back, just walk through the door, walk it through the door. And there you're going to use your ears, mm. but you're going to use your ears mm -hmm. um, to same Hello. sort of pressure Hello. that you're using to hold the bar on your back is going to assure you that the bar is pressed up against the uprights then and then you're going to do the opposite of the zero with rep you're just going to squat it back down so you're going to just squat it to lower it into the um you know semi squat like nice. half squat, yep. quarter squat not even um, yep. to get it back down into the j cup i lost you there for just a split second a few minutes a few minutes ago i don't think i lost you i don't think i lost too much of what you said but the internet went out for a bit. Oh, geez. Wait, are you I was like, I was like, hello, <laughs> Rebecca, where are you? <laughs> yeah, no, see, and so we don't have the video on, so I can see you frantically waving around and thought it sounded different. Like it's, yeah, feedback, it was just like, but the little red recording light is still on. It's still on. Like such no. a low tech, high tech. <laughs> Thanks. No, it's just, I think we got it. We got everything. No, we got everything. No, exactly. I love that. I love that. Listen with your ears. I usually don't, um, I've never used that before because but I do tell people walk into the uprights and I'll explain what the uprights are, mm -hmm. right? This is a J cup. These are the uprights. You're not going to hit the, hurt the uprights. You're not going to hurt the bar. I'd rather the bar, you know, and then something happened to the rack than you get hurt. Do you ever, um, like get people, you know, brand new to barbell training who are mm -hmm. worried about like, but if I walk it right into the J, it makes too much noise. Yeah. Right. Yeah, like exactly. people who are, and I'm like, no, that's a good thing. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Make the noise. Get I want to hear it. Take up space. <laughs> <laughs> I will cue if I'm, what well, typically happens, um, they either are trying to put the bar into the J cups, which as you said, they, they put it in on one side and they, and then they just kind of blindly put the other one in, except it's not in, it's underneath the J cups. Um, I'll tell people, walk it into the uprights, look right, look left, like you're crossing the street uh -huh. and then put the, put the bar down. Um, a lot of times what happens is too the person who's new to this is, the bar is starting to roll down their back, right? They're, they're, uh, yeah. you know, they're, they're not tight because they're thinking about so many things. So the bar is now real. Now the bar is lower on their back than it was because their elbows are dropped. So if I start seeing that, I'll just, once they finish that last rep, I'll say good elbows up, right? Which usually just means, you know, tight back and the elbows will pop up, which will put the bar a little higher now back to the position it should have been. Okay. Now walk it in because if they walk it in with the elbows, if the elbows have dropped, the bar is now, further down their back, they can't get it into the J cups either because now it's like hanging off of their back and you'll see that too. Yeah. You'll see, you'll see that. So I'll, I'll cue, you know, all right, tight back. Okay. Now walk it in. So basically they have to remind themselves, oh yeah, right. There's the bar. The bar is moving down my back. If I don't do this, I'm not gonna be able to put the bar. I'm not gonna get the bar back into the rack, you know, properly. Um, I have a young dancer I'm working with who that's what I've been kind of cueing her. Um, usually it's people who are smaller who don't have a lot of, you know, muscle back there. So they're supporting the bar with their arms because the back's just not, you know, strong enough or big enough yet to support the bar. So I have to watch out for that. But that's, that's sometimes also the case of just making sure that they're tight as tight as from the beginning, which is like you unrack it, you do your set, you want to rack it the same way you took it out. If you can remember how you took it out, right? You took it out with a big chest. You got to walk that baby back in with the same big chest. Yeah. 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 So back to that Superman chest again. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's always the back, the back that, you know, you're never going to be, you're never going to have a relaxed, loose back with any of the exercises. Um, it's just, uh, obviously it's, it doesn't work that way. Um, so yeah, so there's the, there's the squat. I think that pretty much, I mean, I don't know anything else that we want to cover. That is really the key. Those are the key, key points 
of, you know, of your squat, whether you are low bar squatting, high bar squatting, front squatting, you want to make sure that that bar is secure on your back before it comes out of the rack. Once it's out of the rack, focusing on your foot placement, your eye gaze, whether you're looking forward, you're looking down, if you're doing, you know, the bars lower on your back and then treating every single rep as though it was, you were doing singles so that you're replicating the same movement over and over again. That Mike Touche video, I, I, swear, I swear by that video. I love yeah. that video. It's just such a good, he sets up so well. I mean, he spends a, he farts around a bunch to get under the bar. <laughs> you know, he kind of does a bunch of breathing. But once he brings that bar out and once he gets set, I mean, it's just like, it's so, it's like snapshot, snapshot, snapshot. Right, yeah, like it's cookie so cutter. It's so clear. One yeah, together. everything. And every, every rep looks the same. It's like. If you told me that he probably, and you definitely know, oh, oh, I know what I want to, I don't want to forget to say, because I was telling, telling somebody this today with their bench, no matter the empty bar or 405 on the bar, you're going to, you're going to warm up the same way. And you're going to drill that those warm ups as if they were your heaviest set. So you're not going to just blindly and casually, you know, warm up not paying attention to your breathing, not paying attention to your setup, not paying attention to your grip, empty bar or four or five. Because well, if you, yeah. yeah. I, and I mean, I guess like anecdotally often it's like a warm up set or a back off set or something where somebody's not paying as close mm-hmm. attention mm-hmm. where they're more likely a lot of times to, you know, try and shortcut it and end up. Yep you know, tweaking something or yep, whatever. Yep. Not to say that that doesn't happen sometimes on a, on a heavy set. But. Of course. No, but that's, that's usually, I mean, if you're going to half-ass your warm-ups, your work set weight's going to be half-assed. Well, then you're practicing to half-ass that. <laughs> exactly, that. exactly, exactly. You're, and I would tell my- You're establishing a mindset. Yeah, yeah. It's like my warm-ups don't matter. Actually, they do. Your warm-ups matter. Um, I would tell my dancers when they would, um, we would mark- and marking marking a dance piece means not going full out, right? You don't. We're gonna we're going to go through the steps. We're gonna go through the the positions, the placement. Where do you have to be on stage? You can mark it, meaning you don't have to do the jumps, you don't have to do the leaps. But I would never tell them to mark their arms. I was like, you will never ever mark your arms because that's really what people will see in the audience. They don't care about what your legs are doing, but they will care about what your arms are doing. So if you half-ass your arms in re- in rehearsal you're going to half-ass them on stage and then you're not going to look as clean and precise. So it's the same thing here. If you're just going to treat your warm-ups like, yeah, they're just my warm-ups. Well, your work set's not going to go nearly as well because that what you're doing is mentally and physically preparing yourself for that heavier weight. So get into a habit now of trying to fine tune, right? That's your, that's your time to practice the movement too, you know, and, and fix anything that you need to fix before you get to that, that top weight. So that's a key, uh, a key point to, um, to drive home to people too. Yeah. Anything else you want to add? Yeah. I'm not coming that we haven't up talked about. Yeah. yeah. I think that's pretty, I mean, that pretty covers pretty much covers, covers everything that I, uh, I wanted to focus on just like key points for people. And this is whether you're training at a gym or you're training by yourself, or maybe you have a coach and maybe what we've said is something that your coach has been trying to get through to you. And you're like, Oh, now that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder she told me to do it that way. And I was just like, whatever. Um, it's, uh, these are, these are, we kind of use these co- coaching, you know, key points to, uh, to help our lifters with. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's it. That's all I have for me. Um, we're going to be doing this for every single lift. So we're going to also cover obviously the deadlift and the press and the bench on our next few podcasts. So if you've got questions in regards to what we've talked about today with the squat, please feel free to, of course, email me, Emily at five by three.com or email Rebecca at cornerstone strength, Maryland at gmail.com. This is really weird doing this without seeing you. Yeah, I know. You should get your get your camera on your computer. I'm gonna get my camera working because um, here I go. I got class on Wednesday. And I need to see my teacher, or else it's gonna be kind of strange trying to talk to her in Spanish <laughs> without, without being able to see her. <laughs> yeah, your Wednesday is gonna be better than my Wednesday. What's going on with your Wednesday? Weigh in. Weigh in. For the oh yeah the animals for the animals. The 4-H, Rebecca's and, part of a 4-H. Well, the girls are, which makes her part of a 4-H. And it's already a disaster because they just came oh. out with the um, 
time slots and it's all um just not working for us because ay 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 yeah Sadie's got a school concert that night we'd asked for an early time slot now we're like freaking out because we've got a late time slot wait soon they'll be done. they won't have to deal with this oh, yeah I can't wait <laughs> this stuff is just making me so sick this year <laughs> Becca's been stressed out lately. <laughs> hey, if, some... yeah. And if anybody, if anybody likes bacon, let me know. <laughs> let let her know because she'll have she'll have something to give you. Yeah, uh, well, so, no, sell you. <laughs> sell you. Sorry, sell you. Yeah. Sell you. And if anybody's yeah, got looks... like a large property, doesn't want to mow it. I like. Thinks, I like. Thinks a goat would be useful. Let me know. <laughs> I like bacon. Yeah. I'll, I'll buy some bacon from you. Hey, um, you either got to find somebody else to go in on it with you or you got to get yourself a freezer. I'd probably get my dad. I'll talk to him about what kind of how much bacon he wants. The kids are coming this summer, so we got to <laughs> feed them somehow. Um, all right, anyway, that wraps up um, our uh, our podcast for today. Don't forget, Charm City Strong Woman is coming up June 12th, Sunday, June 12th. Um, at 5 by 3 training you can certainly continue to support us through our fundraising page um, there is a link um, in our um, what's it called profile um, for the podcast so please do our campaign our t-shirt campaign ends this Friday so if you're looking for to get a t-shirt um, you can still do so up until Friday May 20th and then of course you can continue to support us through donations through the fundraising page up through the date of the contest thanks very much and uh, we'll be back in a couple weeks with um, either air another exercise or possibly a, a different topic we might kind of do a back and forth like you know talk about this then talk about that oh and a couple weeks we're going to uh, the seminar yeah i know that's what i was just looking at my calendar you got uh -huh. Park city the weekend after we the weekend after the, the weekend after that's right so yeah. it looks like this podcast is coming out this wednesday and then the f next one hopefully will be the first prior before we leave for uh texas yeah we gotta talk about that all right thanks everybody have a great week and uh we'll be back in a couple weeks yeah. thank you rebecca take care bye thanks for listening to five by three radio with emily and rebecca if you like our show and want to know more about five by three training please visit us at www.5 that's f-i-v-e the letter x the number three dot com you can also find us on Facebook and Instagram. To learn more about Rebecca, please visit her website, cornerstonestrengthmaryland.com. Thanks for listening and have a great week.